1897, Russian psychologist Ivan Pavlov introduced the world to the concept of classical conditioning. As a psychologist, Pavlov had been studying the digestive systems of dogs, and this was the primary basis of his 1897 paper. However, during his research, he noticed something interesting. Not only did the dogs begin to salivate when red meat was put into their mouths, but even the sight of red meat would cause them to salivate. It was this observation that led Pavlov to his future work, developing what would become known as classical conditioning. His most famous example involved training dogs to salivate whenever they heard a bell ring, something that is now referred to as the Pavlovian response. This became the dominant theory of human behavior until the mid-1900s. However, classical conditioning was only effective at training subjects to exhibit automatic biological responses when presented with an otherwise unrelated stimulus. It did nothing to address how humans or other animals learn to take voluntary actions. So, enter the picture famed psychologist and behaviorist B.F. Skinner and the idea of operant conditioning. Skinner believed that something like human behavior was far too complex to be explained by classical conditioning alone. Building on the work of Edward Thorndike, Skinner popularized operant conditioning's proposal that human behavior is learned as a result of the environment. The basis of operant conditioning is the carrot and the stick. Good behavior gets rewarded and thus will happen more often, and bad behavior is punished and thus will happen less often. While humans can take an active role in this sort of conditioning, and indeed parents have been utilizing it for all of recorded history, most of the learning doesn't happen as a result of direct instruction. For example, if a child tried to climb onto the kitchen counter but fell off, the pain they would feel after falling off would likely be sufficient punishment to prevent them from trying again in the foreseeable future. However, if the child had instead succeeded and managed to get into a bag of cookies that you kept hidden in the cabinets, that delicious reward would make them try to climb the counters again. Following Skinner's 1938 book, The Behavior of Organisms and Experimental Analysis, operant conditioning supplanted classical conditioning as the dominant theory. It was able to explore so much more of human behavior, but some psychologists still believed that there were problems with this theory. For example, if all human learning was alleged as being the result of operant conditioning, how could we possibly learn something as complex? as language. Skinner argued that initial vocal noises were made as an echoic response to hearing others speak, and then parents would reinforce their children through various cues to turn their echoed noises into coherent language. It was theoretically possible, but in many ways, this was just an insufficient explanation. And this is where Canadian-American psychologist Albert Bandura came in. After high school, Bandura took a job in the Yukon, working on the Alaska Highway. His observations of the culture of heavy drinking and gambling of his co-workers sparked his initial interest in human psychology. When he attended college years later, Bandura found all of his classes boring. He also had a large chunk of time to kill in the morning, so he decided on a whim to sign up for a psychology course as a way to pass the time. This course ignited the spark that he had previously experienced, and he would go on to become one of the most famous and most cited psychologists of all time. Bandura also developed social learning theory. This theory states that learning is a cognitive process rather than purely being conditioned, that it is a social process and that behavior can be learned purely by observation even without the presence of a reward system or any active participation on the part of the individual doing the learning. Of course, Bandura was going to need a way to test this novel and revolutionary theory, and so he decided to teach preschoolers how to be violent. In 1961, Bandura began the first of three experiments he would conduct to test his social learning theory. Since he had been a professor at Stanford University since 1953, the most logical choice was to use children from the university's preschool. Stanford had a lot of graduate students who were also parents, so the preschool would always have a steady supply of test subjects for Bandura to work with. For the 1961 experiments, he selected 72 children ranging from 37 to 69 months old. There were 36 boys and 36 girls, and they were going to be evenly split into three groups. For the experiment, each child would be brought into a room filled with toys. They were brought in, one at a time, so that the other children wouldn't influence their behavior. The child would be seated in one corner of the room that was full of toys like stickers, stamps, dolls, and a tea set. They were then told that the toys in the other corner of the room were only for the adults. In the other corner was a toy set, a mallet, and an inflatable Bobo doll. Now, many of you might be unfamiliar with Bobo dolls, as they are largely a thing of the past, but it was basically just a punching bag for kids. The inflatable doll was designed so that it was heavy on the bottom and was otherwise just filled with air, giving it an extremely low center of mass. Because it was shaped like a bowling bin with a rounded bottom, this low center of mass would cause the doll to always roll itself upright when knocked over. There was also a picture of a cartoon clown named Bobo on the bag, hence the name. Some later versions instead featured the much more famous, but no less creepy, Bozo the Clown. 
Anyway, once a child from the first experiment group was seated, an adult would enter the room and go to the other corner. That adult would then spend the next 10 minutes beating the crap out of Bobo, throwing it around the room, verbally assaulting it, and bashing it in the head with a mallet. To be fair, the supposed verbal assault was really just a description of what the adult was doing. They yelled things such as sock him, kick him, or throw him in the air rather than an actual verbal assault like get f you stupid clown. After 10 minutes of playtime, the child would then be taken to a new room. For the second group, the experiment began the same way, but the adult did not engage in any aggressive behavior towards Bobo. They played with the toy set and ignored the doll entirely. The kids from the second group were also moved to the second room after playing for 10 minutes. The third group was the control group, and they played in their corner for 10 minutes without an adult ever entering the room before being taken to the second room. The second phase of the experiment was referred to as mild aggression arousal, which was the polite psychologist way of saying that they were going to deliberately piss these kids off. The new room the kids were taken to was full of really nice toys, and the experimenter told the kids to have fun and play with the awesome toys. After two minutes, once the child was fully engaged with the new toys, the experimenter came back to stop them. She explains that these were her very special toys, and only the best kids got to play with them, and that she had decided to reserve them for the other children. The child was then taken back to the original room and told that they could play with the toys there. This time, they were left alone in the room for 20 minutes, while being observed through two-way glass. And for that 20 minutes, the researchers watched the children beat out of Bobo. Well, some of them did anyway. There were a few different metrics on which the children were being evaluated. First, the acts of physical aggression were tallied. These included punching, kicking, and throwing Bobo, as well as hitting it with a mallet. The second metric being counted was the acts of verbal aggression, the rather tame phrases we mentioned earlier. Next, they counted how many times the mallet was used to strike something other than Bobo. Even though a child may have struck the wall or another toy with the mallet, using the mallet as a weapon was still behavior that had been demonstrated by the adults. Finally, they made note of how many novel acts of aggression the children took part in. These were any violent acts towards Bobo that had not been previously demonstrated by the adult model. Boys in particular were likely to partake in gunplay despite the adult models never touching the toy guns. The boys would use the guns to threaten, poke, attempt to shoot, and pistol with Bobo. While girls were unlikely to gravitate toward guns, they still engaged in novel acts of violence. One girl began by punching, kicking, and throwing Bobo around the room. She then grabbed the mallet, pins Bobo to the ground, and repeatedly bashed his head with the mallet. After that, she took a break to have an imaginary tea party with some dolls, and then she resumed Then she resumed her attacks on Bobo using a doll as a weapon. There was also a large ball hanging from the ceiling, possibly part of a model solar system. The girl got the ball to swing back and forth, and then she tried to decapitate Bobo. There was a lot of violence against Bobo, both imitated from the adult models and novel, but to what extent did the experiment support Bandura's theory? While the methodology may sound questionable at best to our modern sensibilities, it was actually a resounding success. To try and eliminate any outside variables, Bandura had used a matched pair's design for the experiment. Before the experiment even began, a pair of researchers spent weeks observing the children in the preschool to independently grade their pre-existing levels of aggression. This meant that children in each of the three experimental groups could be compared against others with the same baseline level of aggression. Unsurprisingly, the first group of children, those that were exposed to the aggressive adults, were far more likely to carry out acts of violence against Bobo. As Bandura suspected, the gender of the models played a role as well. Half of the children in each of the non-control groups had a male adult, and the other had a female. Boys were much more likely to imitate aggressive behaviors demonstrated by a male adult than a female adult. The girls showed small differences in their levels of physical and verbal aggression depending on the gender of the adult, but these were small enough as to potentially be statistically insignificant. The experiments also showed much higher instances of aggression in boys than in girls, with the boys committing just over twice as many aggressive acts as the girls. However, perhaps the most interesting individual data set were the instances of novel aggression. Violence may have been more common among the children who had violent adults, but of course it wasn't isolated to them. After all, clowns are stupid. It would be weird if the other kids weren't violent towards Bobo. And because the control group and the group with a non-violent adult hadn't witnessed anything to imitate, any aggression towards Bobo from these groups would be considered novel, even if it was the same act the adults had demonstrated to the first group. While there was a very high level of imitative aggression in the first group and thus more aggression overall, that group had only a slight increase in novel aggression compared to the other two. The control group also had slightly more novel aggression than the group that had watched an adult completely ignore Bobo. All of the results completely supported Bandura's social learning theory. There wasn't even any statistically significant correlation between the predetermined aggressiveness of the children and their behavior in the experiments. This all showed that behavior can be learned from observation, even in the absence of any reward or punishment structure. But why stop there? 
Bandura's initial test may have been a rousing success, but there was still plenty of opportunity to stigmatize media for the next 60 years and counting. When Bandura decided to replicate his experiment in 1963, he wanted to try something a little different. He was satisfied with the conclusions drawn from the initial experiment, so there was no need to include a non-aggressive adult this time around. There wasn't even a need for a control group, as the results from this experiment could just be compared against the control group from 1961. Instead, the only variable Bandura wanted to control was the manner in which the violence was presented. There was a common belief, dating at least as far back as ancient Greek philosophers such as Aristotle, that witnessing violence in a theatrical setting could provide a cathartic release for the audience. Sigmund Freud brought this idea into the field of psychology, suggesting that witnessing intense emotions like anger in a controlled environment could provide catharsis. Bandura decided to test whether this was really the case or if media was actually just another tool for social learning. For the new experiment, Bandura used 96 total participants, 48 boys and 48 girls, and they were again broken up into three groups. The framework of the experiment was mostly the same, but for the first 10 minutes, the children would only be watching an adult rather than playing with toys while the adult was in the room. They would then be taken to a room and deliberately angered before moving back to another room with toys, a mallet, and Bobo. The first group watched an adult assault Bobo. The second group watched a 10-minute video recording of one of these assaults. And the third group watched a 10-minute cartoon of a cat assaulting the Bobo doll in the same way as the human adults had. The results for all three groups were remarkably similar, with all of them showing a dramatic increase in aggressive behavior toward Bobo when compared against the control. All of the other results were consistent with the 1961 study as well, such as boys being generally more aggressive, but also more influenced by the gender of the model that they watched. From this, Bandura concluded that it doesn't matter how children witness aggressive behavior, the children would learn to imitate the behavior, and there was no beneficial cathartic event from watching it on TV. If anything, Bandura would have believed he discovered that watching a media portrayal of these actions had the exact opposite effect. Comparing the average number of aggressive acts taken by the children against Bobo, there was a more than 10% increase when children watched the film of the adult versus the adult in real life. Even more striking, watching cartoon violence resulted in a nearly 20% increase in aggressive acts compared to witnessing the real-life violence. Though Endura did not personally argue that the media portrayals were more effective at teaching aggression, just that behavior could be learned regardless of how it was observed, those results would open a debate that continues to spark controversy to this day. In 1965, Bandura was ready to give the Bobo doll experiment one final attempt. He had shown that social learning could take place without the need for operant conditioning and that it didn't matter how the behavior was observed. However, this didn't mean that the idea of operant conditioning was invalid. As we mentioned earlier, parents have been using it to great effect for thousands of years. Bandura decided to test whether or not operant conditioning could also take place vicariously through social learning. This experiment featured 66 children, 33 boys, 33 girls. Each child was taken by an experimenter one at a time and told they would be brought to a surprise playroom. On the way there, the experimenter said that they had to attend to some business before proceeding to the playroom, then they turned on the TV to entertain the child. The video featured an adult who engaged in four different types of aggressive acts against Bobo, then repeated the sequence of acts in order again. The video lasted for about five minutes, and this was all that the children in the control group saw. The second group saw an additional scene at the end of the movie in which another person entered the room. The second person told the adult what a strong champion they were and that their aggressive behavior deserved to be rewarded. They then poured the model a large glass of 7-Up and gave him a pile of chocolate bars, caramel corn, and other candies which he rapidly consumed. For the final group, there was a much different ending to the movie. Another man entered the room, but instead of rewarding the adult, he waved his finger at the adult and yelled, Hey there, you big bully. You quit picking on that clown. I won't tolerate it. This sudden confrontation caused the adult to take a step backwards, tripping and falling on the ground. The second man then sat on the adult, spanking him with a rolled up magazine and scolding him for his violent behavior. Once the adult broke free and ran away in fear, the second man yelled at him, If I catch you doing that again, you big bully, I'll give you a hard spanking. You quit acting that way. After watching the videos, the children were then taken into a playroom with Bobo and their aggressive actions against the doll were again tallied. The results of this test were mostly predictable. The children were able to learn the behavior through observation, and the boys engaged in more aggressive acts than the girls did. Unsurprisingly, those that watched the adult be punished for their behavior engaged in far fewer aggressive acts than the other groups. If there was any surprise in these results, it was that the group that saw the adult rewarded for his behavior and the control group had no meaningful difference in their behavior. It suggested that vicarious reinforcement could discourage behavior if punishment was witnessed, but that witnessing someone else being rewarded did little to encourage that. 
that behavior. However, for this experiment, Bandura conducted a second series of tests. These groups of children were again shown the three different videos, but this time all participants, regardless of which video they watched, were told that they would be given juice and candy if they replicated the actions that they saw in the video. The promise of personal incentives negated any effect of an observed punishment, with all three groups showing similar increases in aggressive behavior. Interestingly, this version of the test eliminated any gender-based differences in the results. Previously, boys had been less likely to imitate aggressive female adults, and girls in general were less likely than boys to display aggressive behavior. This led to the proposition that children might only take part in social learning when they believed that the witness behavior was appropriate for their gender. The new results dispelled this belief as there was no difference in aggression between boys and girls. All they wanted was the candy. While it was previously hypothesized that social learning hadn't taken place in the instances where the aggressive behavior wasn't replicated, trying to ply the children with candy showed that all of them had learned the behaviors, they just hadn't all outwardly expressed what they had learned. The children's perception of gender norms may have influenced whether or not they chose to imitate the behavior they saw, but it was now clear that it had no impact on whether or not social learning was actually taking place. Now, deliberately teaching violence to children might not seem like a great idea, but the methodology of the Bobo doll experiments were not considered controversial at the time. After all, Bandura had no problem repeating the experiment two more times after publishing his initial results from the 1961 test. That said, the experiments may fall short of modern ethical standards, specifically because the children could not give informed consent, were not able to withdraw from the experiments, and were not debriefed afterwards to have the purpose of the experiment explained to them. There were also some concerns that teaching the children to display aggression could lead to behavioral problems outside of the experiments that would have lasting effects on their development and, by extension, their entire lives. But these concerns were overall rather mild, especially when compared to other more horrific psychological studies that were being performed on children at the time. Most of the criticism levied against Bandura was related to the nature of the study itself. For example, the children and the adults were complete strangers. This was not indicative of how social learning takes place in the real world, where behavior is typically learned from family members or classmates. There was also essentially no cool-down period between exposure to the aggressive behavior and the opportunity to replicate it. This meant that it was impossible to draw meaningful conclusions on the long-term effects of such exposure and whether or not the observed behaviors would remain learned for extended periods of time without having been replicated. Another criticism that eventually arose uh, was the sample of children used. They were all taken from the preschool at Stanford University, which meant that the test subjects were all children of either students or professors at Stanford. As such, the experiment was almost exclusively using white children from well-off families, so the results could not necessarily be assumed to apply to children across other demographics. But perhaps most importantly, one major flaw in how Bandura treated the experiment was to assign intent to the children's actions. The experiment was designed to model aggressive behavior, but that doesn't mean that the children were motivated by aggression. Children like to please adults, particularly by emulating them. There isn't really a lot of thought behind these decisions. The kids are just mimicking what they saw. For example, if you were to stub your toe and yell before realizing that your three-year-old child was in the room, when they inevitably repeat the word back to you, it wouldn't mean that they were angry or in pain. The child is just copying what they saw without any of the motivation that adults may ascribe to that action. Hitting an inflatable doll is also very unlike any real-life violence that the children may encounter, so while the actions may seem overtly aggressive to adults, the children may have just thought that it was the appropriate way to play with that particular toy. And this brings up another point that Bandura completely missed in all of his experiments. Although he tried to account for every variable possible, including the children's baseline level of aggression, there was one variable that was not considered. It's also something that many younger viewers may have asked themselves when initially clicking on this video. What the hell is a Bobo doll? Though they were once much more common, these sorts of inflatable dolls are hardly popular anymore. If you grew up in the 1980s, there was a decent chance you knew they existed, primarily from television, but you probably never saw one in person. And this turned out to be a major factor in a 1990s recreation of Bandura's experiment by Dr. Guy Cumberbatch. According to Cumberbatch, children who had no previous experience with a Bobo doll engaged in five times as many acts of aggression towards it. This suggested that the children's behavior may have been strongly motivated by the novelty of a self-writing doll rather than by actual aggression. But despite any shortcomings of Bandura's experiments, they have had a profound effect on psychology and society in general. These helped lay the foundation for social learning theory, which quickly became the dominant theory for how children learn. While the idea that kids can learn from watching other people without needing to engage in operant conditioning seems obvious to us all now, it was a pretty revolutionary stance at the time. 
Of course, the downside of this is the heavy scrutiny that fell on the media as a result. Pandora's work has been cited countless times in attempts to ban violent television shows, movies, and video games. It led to the creation of the ESRB ratings for video games and undoubtedly hindered many creative endeavors by forcing the creators to censor their works. Pandora's research has even been used to promote total bans on video games, though these efforts have been unsuccessful. Hundreds of studies have been conducted in the decades that follow, and despite the claims of some supposed experts, no conclusive link has been found between violent television and video games and real-world acts of violence or even aggressive behavior. Then again, none of that was what Bandura was trying to prove in the first place. Bandura just sought to test his theory of social learning, specifically as it related to children and mimicry. Though his experiments did demonstrate that children were able to imitate behavior they saw on a screen, it also showed that they wouldn't engage in those behaviors when they observed that such actions had consequences. Nothing from these experiments should have any weight when trying to argue that Call of Duty causes teenagers to commit gun violence. But all of the nuance from Bandura's research was lost on those who were trying to vilify the media thanks to a damn cartoon cat. And there's no sign that these attempts to ban fictional depictions of violence are going to stop anytime soon.